Good morning. Do we have audio? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Roman, we're just making sure everyone is on the call here. Um, and we'll get started in just 30 seconds. Okay. Do you have um, the mayor? Yep. Can you promote her to be able to talk? Yep. Yep. We sure do. So this is a little different than when we do the emergency calls, right? Uh, yes, Alan had asked us to use, we're using the same format uh, via Zoom as we do for the BOCC meetings. Okay. So, you guys so yeah, there she yep, is. So, yeah, yeah, so it wasn't, yeah, it was different. I was like, I can't speak and I can't see myself. So what up? <laughs> Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy, Happy Monday, Monday, Mayor. Kevin declined. Okay, then, and I can see you both. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, I wanna thank everyone for uh, taking the time today out of their busy schedule. Um, as you're aware, this is uh, a, basically we haven't used the countywide coordinating call as a base um, for this discussion. Uh, so you know who your audience, uh, fellow audience members are. Um, as well as a few additional guests. And as always, um, the media is a get our guest on the call. And we have, in addition, to open this up uh, to members of the public to listen in and comment as well. Um, the topic of discussion is um, the hurricane evacuating modeling um, that is coming for the Florida Keys, coming out of uh, the Florida Department of, of Commerce. The format for today's call we will hear from opening remarks from the mayor, uh, Mayor Rashine, and then we will turn it over to our county administrator, Roman Gustazi, um, to help facilitate the discussion. Uh, and um, when that time comes, if you just uh, will raise your hand, um, we can promote you and um, you will be able to uh, ask questions and discuss um, to your heart's desire, right? <laughs> so with that, we'll get started and I'll turn it over to Mayor Rashine. Thank you, Shannon, so much for getting everybody together and to Roman and his team. I know this um, is uh, gonna be probably a high level call. We're gonna going to hear from different entities, uh, a few initial thoughts and things like that, but we will need to regroup on this probably a, a few more times before um, you know, we send messages back to the state and so on and so forth. So as you mentioned, uh, today's call is to kind of get everybody on the same page regarding the Department of Commerce's uh, recent update. I don't know if anybody had the chance to call into the webinars. I did call into one of them on our hurricane evacuation model. And I think the second one was relatively the same. The presentation was the same. Maybe there were some additional questions from our community stakeholders. So thank you for all of those who have attended and uh, and asking some really good questions. So basically the three, three overarching goals are public safety, uh, ensuring safe and timely evacuation of visitors and residents in the event of an emergency, quality of life, of, of course, very important. Prom uh, we wanna promote balanced growth, workforce housing, assurance that development is supported by, it's very important, required infrastructure, and obviously a sound economic base. And then lastly, and uh, I think equally important is our environmental protection, um, protecting our natural beauty. And of course, the many, many uh, ecosystems that reside, live, um, are, are awesome in the Florida Keys. So those are kind of the three tenants that we wanna look at as we move forward with this. And uh, again, thank you all so much. I know we'll probably have uh, a minute for some closing comments, but I do ask that participants keep uh, their questions really targeted, really tailored. Again, this is a, an initial high level call, probably uh, not the only one that we'll be having. So with that, I will turn it over to our esteemed county administrator, Mr. Roman Gustezzi. Uh Thank you, Mayor, and good morning to everybody and happy holidays to everybody. Um, Yes, and you see Bob, uh, our county attorney, is uh, also promoted. He's going to be uh, speaking also, and Emily, our um, our planning director. Uh, we're going to kind of ham and egg it, I like to call it, as staff. But I'll kick it off. I like to call this a community conversation, and this is an issue that affects us all, of course. 
And uh, let's face it, it could be a very sticky issue. Um, so we need to have a, a community conversation on this. And the bottom line is uh, how many uh, uh, additional building permit allocations will be distributed throughout the Keys in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, right now, the range is zero to 7,954. That's how many lots are still available in the Keys. So that would be giving one to each lot. Uh, we need to find that sweet spot between uh, stated goals that the, the, the mayor said of quality of life and environmental protection. I use a term called knowledge calibration, and that's what we're trying to do here today. Make sure that we're all at least knowledgeable of what what the what the process is and where we are. Um, and I like to I need to understand the, the the why, the what, and the how of this issue. And the why, um, as the mayor mentioned, is that that public safety, quality of life, environmental protection. The what is, can we find a sweet spot between the two? Or are we gonna be on one end or the other? Um, that's the what, that's what the final outcome sometime here in the near future. And then the how, um, the Florida Department of uh, Commerce has been mentioned recently ran six scenarios. And they wanna know what our preferred scenario is uh, as far as the county and the community. Uh, now we can do this collectively as a unified community and find that sweet spot. Uh, we can individually send comments up uh, and preferred alternatives to the state and they'll find it for us and they'll choose for us. So that's where we're at. My understanding is that the state uh, is going to, the Department of Commerce is going to be sending the modeling results to uh, both the legislature uh, and the administration commission, which is the governor and cabinet in January uh, during the legislative session. Um, I'll stop there. Bob, did I miss anything, or Emily, as far as before we start talking about the, the actual um, scenarios as far as the process? I would just, as a preliminary matter, just mention that while this is a public meeting, it's not a noticed public meeting, which is, complies with all uh, aspects of the Sunshine Law. So if any um, of the electeds are going to speak, I would recommend highly that it only be one elected per jurisdiction just to be compliant with the Sunshine Law. Great. Thanks, Bob. And I see that Emily brought up the clearance time summary. Um, this is what it's all about. You see the, the six scenarios on the left. Um, the baseline scenario is always one. And then you have five that they actually ran. Um, and I hope you can all see the cursor. Thank you, Emily. Uh, my van of white here today. Um, and then the, across the top, there's four columns, uh, and two include the, the Key West and two do not include the Key West. And let's have that conversation right away. I think we should exclude the, the two that exclude Key West and get rid of those two columns right away because it just doesn't make sense. Uh, Bob, help me out again. We think that that and the mobile homes issue could be solved legislatively quite simply, maybe simply is a bad word, but it could be solved legislatively. That way we don't have to deal with those scenarios. That is correct. The um, reason the Key West and the mobile homes are factored in is a result of the Matino decision, which came about when three of the municipalities um, were challenged on their acceptance of the 300 workforce ROGOs, the early evacuations. And because of the way that decision came out, the department obviously felt compelled to make scenarios with Key West without mobile homes in the early evacuation of mobile homes in the um, resident permanent resident evacuation. So that's why there's information like that. That doesn't necessarily control the outcome if we get a legislative change to address certain aspects of the Matino decision. But, but we're confident that we can just narrow it down to the one column, correct? Oh yeah, I mean, you, you, they've asked us for our input and I think we should give input that makes the most sense operationally, uh, public safety wise. And so that would be including Key West as we have always modeled and modeling the mobile home, homes because they're more vulnerable structures to evacuate earlier. And I assume also that uh, put Shannon on the spot here. Shannon, you feel comfortable with that too. You, you want... Key West included and the mobile homes included in, in phase one, correct? 
That is correct. Um, from an operational standpoint and standpoint and decision making, uh, that is the most the you know the most true, the most comprehensive, um, and the most efficient way you know we need to plan when we evacuate this county. Right. So that narrows it down to the one, which is the second column, uh, makes it the conversation simpler. And let's talk about phase one and phase two, just again, for knowledge calibration purposes that everybody knows and understands what that is. And Shannon, help me out if I miss something. Uh, phase one is 48 hours, and that's visitors, uh, campers, people staying at the parks, national parks, the, the, the state parks and so forth, and of course, mobile homes. So they have to all leave in 48 hours. That's phase one. And then phase two is permanent residents, uh, 24 hours, uh, need to leave in 24 hours or less. Shannon, did I miss anything about the phases? Nope, you got it. You're correct. Okay. So phase one, we really don't have to talk about much because I think all the all the alternatives uh, meet and they're okay. They check that box. So we can, fit, we can just focus on the 24 hours. And you can see that the baseline modeling uh, meets that goal. That means no more allocations, no more building permits throughout the keys, and it sits right at 24 hours. Then there's three scenarios, one, two, and three are the same number of allocations, 3,550. That's a magic number that came from 10 years ago, when which you can see S3 there, how it was distributed. The only difference in these, in these three alternatives is that how they're distributed. S3, scenario three, would be using the same distribution that we did 10 years ago. And you can see the number breakdown there. Uh, phase S1 would be based on population size. And then S2 would be based on the vacant lands, percentage of vacant land. S4 is a, what they call the minimal allocations, which is 11 allocations per year throughout the, the Keys. And you can see the breakdown there. Monroe County would get five. Marathon, Alamrod, and Key West would get two which Key West is be only for affordable housing. And then S5 is giving a building permit to each available um, uh, lot that's available now, a, a vacant lot, which there's 7,954 lots. So each lot would get an allocation. So that's that's the six phases, uh, excuse me, the six scenarios that have been run so far. We talked to the state a few times about this and they are willing to run more modeling scenarios. So if, if somebody has an idea, I'm not sure of the process for any other folks, but for us in the government world, we would just make that request uh, and they would run an additional uh, scenario if needed. So we will be talking about that with the county commission next month, which leads to, to my next steps. Um, we, we all need to get together with our respected policy making boards in my case, and Bob and Emily's, of course, that's the county commission. Our next meeting is December 13th. And I'm sure we'll be talking a lot before then. And we'll have some ideas. And then probably, I'm going to say probably, because you never know, but probably the county commission will, will select a preferred alternative at, the, at that point. And then we can probably have another one of these meetings sometime in January. And like the mayor said, we might have more than one and see if we can come up with uh, a collective county-wide, community-wide uh, sweet spot. Bob or Emily, did I miss anything? Uh, that concludes uh, my presentation and, and my thoughts. And we can go into Q&A unless I've missed them. Bob, we're good? Not hearing from Emily. You want to go okay. back to the screen? Okay. Do you want me to take this down? Yeah, uh, yeah you could just be ready to put it back up if somebody has a question. But yeah, take okay. it down for now. Thank you. And... Um, Shannon, I guess if anybody wants to talk, they have to raise their hand and then you promote them or Valerie promotes them. Is that how this works? That's correct. All right. So, do we have any raised hands, Valerie? No. Nope. We have no raised hands at this time. <laughs> well, Bob did, said, did such a good job in the presentation. Emily, yeah. you going to take, take this thing down, Emily? Try and get the job. I do this every day. I'll get it down eventually. Give me a minute. Okay. All right. We're, getting, we're, we're, we're starting to get some raised hands. And also, okay, good. I think everybody's trying to uh, comprehend and, and take into account everything that you just shared with them. So give them a second, maybe. Sure. Ann Olson. Okay. We have uh, first hand raised is Ann Olson. Good morning. Go ahead. 
Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Are, are we going to have one opportunity to speak or multiple if we have other questions as we have this interaction conversation? You mean today? Yes. Sure. No, we can keep, we, this is interactive. This is a community okay. conversation. And so, okay. I want to hit you with all my questions at once then. Um, one thing I'm really struggling to understand with the modeling is that if 10 years ago, back in 2012, um, the model numbers for phase two were actually 26 and a half hours. And since that time, and that was discovered in the, um, the Rogo challenge, the Matino discovery re referenced earlier. Um, if the time frame then was 26 and a half hours, and since that time we've built 3,500 plus more building allocations, our population has increased on the census. And well, in, in, in one of the models, mobile homes were included, but without them, we dropped from 26 and a half hours down to 24 with all those increases. How could that be possible? Uh, I'm not the modeler. I'm going to get myself in trouble trying to answer that. But um, I think that's a better, uh, it's, a, it's a question that, that goes to the state and the modeling folks. But I think it has to do with the, the demographics have changed and there's a lot more second homeowners. And that allows more of a throughput. Um, but again, that's just, this was a county administrator trying to be a modeler for a minute here. But it has something to do with that. And that definitely you should ask them if you haven't already. Um, the state we, is not on the call, so they, they're not here to answer right. this. We, we did ask, but they didn't answer that um, very directly. I, I, I'm i just thinking from a common sense standpoint, that does not make a lot of sense that the numbers went down, even if they're now um, second homeowners. It, that the 2012 model really ignores the proliferation of of, um, uh, of vacation rentals and how many of those houses, yes, on the census are empty on April 1st, but um, are now chock full throughout the summer and the uh, hurricane season with vacationers um, who don't know our rules, don't know when to evacuate and so forth. So I, I think these this data is rather skewed um, in terms of reality. That's why we're having these these calls. I think I think it's important for you to understand that for for me to understand that. But you know, I've been here now 15 years. Thank God, every day's a record. Kind of commissioners, thank you. Um, when I started, it was 38 percent second homeowners. When it was Hurricane Irma, it was about 48 percent second homeowners. Now we don't have I don't have a real good data yet, but I've been told it's 65 to 70 percent, and maybe Key West it's even more than that as far as second homeowners. So since they leave in phase one, they leave earlier, they don't count towards phase two. So that's, I think that's what the play is. And again, I get myself in trouble talking about the little knowledge that I have with this stuff, but that's how it's been explained to me over the years. Um, but hopefully you can get a better answer, a more detailed answer from, from the state. Okay, and just I'll wrap my questions, but again, all the modeling that we just saw up that you looked at, um, you know, you're talking, looking at one of your considerations, I think it's S3 adding 3,500 plus more allocations and the time only goes up an hour, a half an hour here and there. And I guess overall, I I'm curious how you can square um, the fact that a lot of those scenarios did exceed the 24 hour um, evacuation mandate in terms of what yeah. options you're looking at. And great questions. Don't stop, don't stop asking them. They're great questions. I hope you get some, some answers from folks that really know what, what they're doing um, and, and know the details of this stuff. It's important. Roman, we have... Next, Roman, we have uh, Todd Stoughton with the city of Key West. Go ahead, oh, Todd. Oh, boy, this is going to be a tough question. <laughs> It, it's not a tough question. It's what's your favorite side with the turkey? No. <laughs> uh, my only question, I would have put this in chat, but it was disabled. Uh, your commission meeting, your county commission meetings, the 13th, ours is the 14th. Not sure that we're going to get this. Um, uh, you know, I'm sure that our commission is probably going to want to hear what your commission does. What's the timelines for us collectively or individually getting this to the state? Uh, good question. Uh, we th What the state told us is that, the, like I, I said in my opening remarks, they're going to give this information to both legislature and, and the um, administration commission. So the decision looks like it's going to be made during the session. 
I think uh, as far as the, the tweaks, for sure, as far as keeping, including you all, the, the Key West and uh, in the model and the uh, the mobile homes. So I suspect, and I don't know, Bob, if you got any more, but they, they didn't give us a, a like a hard date. You know, they didn't say by January 15th, you have to have your comments in or anything like that. So that's my understanding as right now. And since session starts, what, January 8th? Right. Early to mid-January at the absolute latest, I would say. Preferably before session starts. Thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll probably just have it as a discussion item, attend your meeting, and then uh, take that to the commission the day after your meeting, and then we'll get back to you. I like the collective. I'll see what they say, but I, I like you know one fight, one voice. So uh, I think that we'll be in line with you on that. And thank you very much. Yeah, and just and I failed to mention we as a, as a, the county administrator and and the other five uh, municipal managers we met on Friday and we're going to meet again, and we will continue to meet. And we'll try to find as staff some kind of you know sweet spot, or where our commission. And of course, we're always talking to the commissioners, and so we might have an answer for you for the 14th. Or you said that your meeting is the 12th or the 14th. 14th. Okay, so you already know what what the county commission is going to do. Um, but yeah, we we hope to have the six of us, the county and the five municipalities, a, a collective one unified uh, preferred alternative. By the 13th meeting? By your 13th? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we can get that. Yes. We'll, we'll have that to you. Yeah. Well, tell your boss to, to get it together. And call us out. <laughs> He's off today, which is why you got me. So. All right. That's all right. Okay, Roman. Next, we have uh, Steve Estes. Steve, if you would um, state your organization. Barometer. Am I Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Wasn't yeah. sure my mic was working. A uh, couple of questions. The scenarios presented to us, none of them, other than the baseline model, said to leave things as they are. Um, the other five scenarios are all, let's exceed the 24-hour mandate. So I guess this question is, Bob, what would it take? for the state to, oh, I know the state can wave its arms and say yes, but what would it take for the state to waive its own 24 hour public safety mandate? Statutory change, or um, I think scenario four. Scenario four, um, the middle one, yeah. The middle one had a very limited number of allocations that kept us at 24 hours. If the mobile homes are modeled in phase one, as we have been, doing in the past. Okay. Um, now, I, I'm not sure who has looked at, at the modeling, but you said second homes now are at 65%. Uh, did we factor in, as Ann was speaking of, the fact that those a lot of those houses are filled during hurricane season? Uh, probably 50% of what we think is vacant is probably filled. Um, how, do we get, how do we get those folks in there? Yeah, Steve, that's the whole behavioral model. They, they use a behavioral, uh, you know, how people behave. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what they used, you know, all the, all the data. We haven't seen all the data. Okay. So we have run the models. It was the Department of Commerce and their um, consultant that ran the models. But they, they, didn't give us the, uh, they didn't give us the assumption and variables that they worked on? No. I mean, I haven't seen them. Emily, I don't think you've seen them either, right? No. No, we had asked to see that, but we were not given that info. Right. Okay. Um, well, Holly, I, I'm glad you're on there because the next question is is you as a policymaker. The county commission has said at least twice that they don't want any more allocations beyond this term. Uh, but yet we most of the scenarios we get other than one give us extra allocations. So your opinion on that, if you have one? Yeah, Steve, I think it's too early for me to give opinion, plus many of my colleagues are on on this. But if you are happy to contact me offline, happy to chat more. I will definitely do that. Thank you. Okay. That's it for now. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next, we have a representative from Haran Law on the line. If you could state your name, please. David Paul Haran. Thank you, David. Go ahead. 
Um, that I won't make it long, but let me let me tell you that I am now looking at kind of deja vu. Um, years ago, I told one of my uh, closest friends, David Rice, that by going along with what DCA or now whatever they call it uh, for Monroe County to control its population growth. Um, would would be a check that our grandchildren couldn't cash. I was wrong. I don't think our great great grandchildren would be able to cash that check. Um, he told me then. He said, "You know, Tallahassee will stand behind us uh, because uh, we certainly couldn't afford that." And uh, and I said, "No, Tallahassee is going to turn around and tell you." Well, gee whiz, we can't ever make Monroe County pass local legislation that would violate the Constitution. That's that we can't do that. Okay, so that's where right now, that's where we are. Because I do believe that those 18 words in the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution that says that no private property shall be taken for public purposes without due process of law and just compensation paid. It includes temporary takings. There's case law in the Supreme Court, temporary takings. Now, if you can tell me how people that continue to pay ad valorem taxes on property are not suffering a temporary taking, then, then, then have at it, because I don't think you can. I don't think there's a shortcut around the Fifth Amendment. And I believe that what we're talking about right now is something that uh, ultimately will end up before the courts, and the courts are going to rule that if you deny somebody the right to use the property that they've been paying taxes on, that's kind of an unwritten caveat of why we pay taxes is to make sure that y'all, the county commission and everybody will protect our right to uh, to use our property. That's it. Now, I don't think that, I don't think that's going to, I don't think that's going to uh, go over well. I do believe that what we're talking about right now is the central question is, is there a shortcut around the Fifth Amendment. I didn't believe that there was then. I don't believe that there is now. And um, and and so I believe that we've got to address the issue. And the only way to address that issue is to figure out. And I and and Jim Hendrick and I, by the way, we were we were good friends. Uh, one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. But uh, but. Well, the issue is going to be um, how do you pay even for temporary takings, much less for the full-blown taking. And we're talking about full-blown takings, by the way. We're talking about telling people that have been paying taxes for years and years, I'm sorry, you can't use your property. And then uh, we're going to have to compensate them for what for what their, their property is worth. And uh, I'm, I'm, I certainly understand all this about uh, hurricane evacuation and everything. That was that was something that uh, Jim and I talked about numerous times. Uh, he, he, he had a he had, that was a real interesting part of our conversations is that hurricane evacuation. Hurricane evacuation was it would certainly be cured by four laning all of US one, four laning the entire thing. Uh, number two, um, passing legislation that, that gives you an incentive to combine lots. We do that now. Those are the kind of things that will take care of some of it. But you all better start looking for a source of, uh, of funding because uh, ultimately um, the, the Constitution is going to rule and uh, and just compensation will have to be paid. So I'll get off my soapbox now. But that's that that I think is exactly the compens the conversation I had with David Rice over 20 years ago. And uh, 
And, and I think that it, that is being borne out now. Thank you. Thank you, David. Bob, you just compelled to answer anything? Well, it's all being taken into consideration. You saw the different scenarios. There's only one that has no more allocations. Um, if there are allocations to grant, there is not an immediate taking. Um, so as long as there is a chance under the Penn Central analysis, there is no taking. I'd also point out that many of the lots, the tier one lots, the ones that have been deemed environmentally sensitive, effectively don't pay any taxes because the tax collector doesn't send a bill to anybody less than a nominal rate. And I think that's in the 250, 300 range owed. So um, all 7,900 lots do not get a property tax bill. Right. Thanks, Bob. Shannon, we have any others? We do have a, a few more. Uh, next, we have Daniel Samus. Daniel, if you'll go ahead and state your organization. Sure. Hey, everyone. Daniel Samus, Greater Marathon Chamber of Commerce. Do you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. Hey, Rome. Um, oh, and uh, to start, the dark meat of the turkey is the best. Um, <laughs> more importantly, I guess my questions, guys and, and ladies, would be um, regarding the allocations, it, will it be up to the municipalities and then, of course, the county on how they are, I guess, uh, labeled? Will they be um, market rate and or workforce, affordable housing, deed restricted? Um, how will, will that be handled? Will it be, again, individually based on the municipality and or the county or will the state tell us? Um, and then secondly, after that, yeah, after that question, infrastructure because it's kind of you know uh there's a number of pieces to the puzzle and it's a bit of a tight timeline it sounds like um as bob mentioned moving into legislature in january uh, obviously if we do move move forward with adding more allocations it, it puts more pressure on our infrastructure not only roads um sewer stormwater wastewater all that good stuff will that be worked into this process obviously as a lot of the cities um, may need to uh, improve that their infrastructure and will require substantial investment for. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, all that's being considered and talk, we're talking about all that and I'm sure the county commission you know, they'll want to hear from the various entities that are involved in, in the utilities and and uh, before they make their decisions. It's, you're right. All that is, is very important to consider before we come up with a preferred alternative. Bob uh, or anybody else on staff want to add anything? I would say it's probably too soon to tell whether there's going to be a mandate from the state, you know, the terms of workforce versus market rate affordable. Um, but if the jurisdictions want to include that in their recommendation on a split out, if that's what their recommendation is, that would be helpful information. Yep. Got it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Daniel. Good to hear your voice. Happy holidays. Okay, Roman, uh, we just have four more. We have a gentleman um, by the name of Brian on the line. Brian, if you're there, can you state your first and last name and the organization you represent? Sure. Uh, Brian Schmidt, Coldwell Banker, Schmidt Real Estate. You guys hear me okay? Yes. Yep. So um, Daniel just asked some of the questions that uh, I was uh, most interested in, but the only option here, it seems like, is boarding these allocations over a 10-year horizon. Um, ROGO, as it as it recently expired, was over a much longer horizon. Is there, so unless we issue all the allocations or the state issues all the allocations for build out in this next 10-year period, this discussion, I assume, will happen again in another 10 years because as the taking issue is never, is not going to go away until uh, well, it probably will never go away. But um, is there an option for a longer horizon um, in the legislature, legislation, which would um, hopefully allow local government to? I don't. I don't. I, I think it would be impossible for local government to to get the infrastructure in place uh, to award all these allocations over a ten-year horizon. It would be impossible, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Great question. And I think just by, I think the, the quick answer is yes, because the state already gave us a 20-year option with the uh, scenario four, 
of the minimal. So if they're if they're already running that scenario, I'm assuming that's we can we can ask for to that too. So um, I don't know, Bob, did, does that make any sense or Emily, right? Yeah. So the answer is yes. If we want to do it a longer horizon and not have to do this every 10 years, we can, and if that's what we want to do again, collectively unified, that's, I think that would be uh, something that the state would, would recognize and we could really consider. Thanks, Roland. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Um, next, we have Robert Gold. If you could state your name and your, the organization you're representing, Robert. Good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Robert Gold. Um, I live in Key West. I am a member of the board of Last Stand. But to be clear, I am speaking on, by, on behalf of myself as a concerned citizen. At Last Stand, we're very careful to coordinate our public statements. And what I'm about to ask does not necessarily represent the position of Last Stand. I have three questions. I think each of them can be um, answered uh, simply. Um, and rather than ask all three in sequence, I'd rather ask each one um, and then wait for the answer and continue. Um, my first question, can you please confirm the um, process by which allocations happen? My understanding is that the state legislature will make a decision about if and how many allocations will be awarded as a result of this process. And perhaps I'm wrong. I see Mr. Schillinger um, uh, ready to comment on this. Um, but my question really is once that is done and assuming some number comes from the state, are the local entities, the, the county for the unincorporated areas and the municipalities, are they under any obligation to issue permits? All right, let me answer that. And the reason I was shaking my head, the, the start with the premise, the state's legislature sets the evacuation number, the, the time period. They've done that by statute. Um, the actual distribution and award of allocations has come from an entity known as the State Administration Commission. That's the governor and his cabinet. They sit in various different functions the parole board, the pension board, things like that. And one of them is called the administration commission. And in that capacity, they issue an administrative rule that dictates the number of allocations awarded to each jurisdiction. So it all comes from the state, but it's a separation of powers issue. So this, the legislature sets the time frame, and then it's implemented by the administration commission. Um, once those allocations are uh, awarded to a jurisdiction, a city or one of the cities or the county, um, the, the local government can control the rate of distribution. So in the county, for example, in the past, we were given uh, we were giving out 126 market rate allocations a year and we voluntarily reduced the rate of flow of that in half to what was it? At roughly 60 some um, each year to stretch ours out over time to give our uh, land purchasing partners uh, more opportunity to buy up some vacant land and retire some development rights. So it would be up to the jurisdiction if it wanted to, to reduce the flow of those allocations once awarded from the state. Now, remember, getting back to an earlier part of the discussion, there is takings liability if there is no chance whatsoever to develop. So there's a, a balance to be struck there. So they, if a jurisdiction were to take them and then hold them and not give them out, they might face some financial liability. Thank you. I appreciate uh, the detail in your answer, um, and I think I understand it. So once the municipalities or the jurisdictions have um, the ability to issue permits, it will be the result of a political process, essentially pressure from the community versus pressure from the developers that may result in how many allocations are issued. Is that a fair representation of what would happen next? Yes. Okay. I mean, we've, you know, we've part of their their development uh, land development code and stuff like that. But yeah, that yeah. those are the those are the two forcing pressures. 
My second question is, I think it's very brief, but my understanding is that the model does not include any consideration for the availability of gasoline at filling stations during a, uh, a, a required evacuation. What we've seen in recent times is uh, Monroe County is especially vulnerable to gasoline supply. And if we have a forced evacuation or mandatory evacuation of the entire county, I'm assuming that gas stations will run out of gas and the cars will um, stall on the road because they're trying to make it to that last gas station. And I have heard no evidence of that being factored into the model. Does anyone have any insight about gasoline supply with respect to the evacuation model? I don't, but I know I'm looking at their presentation. If, uh, uh, Mr. Bold, if, did you see the, the webinar? You... Yes. Okay. And since you're part of Last Stand, I'm sure Ann, you know, she she had all the slides, which was great. Thank you again, Ann, for doing that because she sent them to me. So I'm looking at the one slide on page uh, 15, and they go through the different overview of what they used, what the variables were used. And I don't know if there, there's some variables in here that might include gas stations, but I don't know the details. Again, we haven't seen the data. But again, that's what that'd be a good question for the state because yeah. they have. They have the problem is that, uh, and you know, if you can express this on our behalf, the statement made it very difficult to ask questions. You had to submit the questions in advance. Um, there was no real time question and answer. The answers that they gave, there was no opportunity for recourse or you know follow up question. Um, it was uh, the barest minimum of a public process. My last question really has to do with takings. Um, and I understand the 18 words in the Constitution, but I also understand um, the reality of the decisions that people make when they purchase property in Monroe County. If somebody purchased a property in Monroe after the institution of BPAS ROGO system, they were accepting a known risk that they would not be able to build on their property. So my statement really is, how can anyone be concerned about a takings lawsuit if in fact the person who is bringing the lawsuit purchased the property after uh, rogo b pass was instituted my question is of the nearly eight thousand properties do we know what share of them have been purchased had been purchased and are still owned by individuals before b pass rogo and how many of them were purchased with full knowledge that building would not be possible. I don't think we've done that analysis. Right. I can speak generally on it. You know, it's hard to show, we use the term full knowledge. It's hard to show on a 10,000 foot level what the full knowledge was with each person that purchased it. But you do make an interesting point that those who purchased it with um, you know, subsequent to the enactment of these regulations are at least charged with constructive knowledge of the regulations in place. And so that would certainly be an argument that we would be raising in a takings case, assuming it's an as applied Penn Central analysis, assuming that there is a chance to build. If there is a complete shutoff of allocations and there are none, no more to award, then you switch the analysis to a more of a Lucas take, a, um, you know, it's a facial taking. And then the, um, you know, the analysis is completely different. You don't have the Penn Central factor, such as the reasonable investment back to expectations, including the knowledge of the uh, land development regulations at the time of purchase. So um, you have to keep the fa that factor in place, as well as the fact that takings law is, for all intents and purposes, um, based on constitutional principles, it's all judgment, judge-made law. It's all interpretation. And as the courts evolve over time with different appointments, um, we've seen takings law evolve. So the trick is not to be anchored into the false sense of security that longstanding cases are always going to remain the same. We have a much more friendly property rights bench at the U.S. Supreme Court. 
and we have a much more friendly property rights bench, property rights friendly bench at the Florida Supreme Court. So, um, yes, we will be relying on existing case law, but we also have to be mindful that the parameters to which it's applied may change. And we've even seen that with a recent decision out of the third DCA with respect to Marathon. So. Thank you, Robert. I, I do appreciate uh, your um, learned answer. Um, no, um, no sarcasm there at all. I'm not a lawyer. Um, and uh, um, I appreciate that. Um, I, I guess a final statement, though, that I'd like to make with regard to takings. That word gets thrown around a lot, including by some of our elected officials who may be on this call. We need numbers. How many cases have been brought? How many have been argued successfully in Monroe County? We need to know before a decision is made because of an anxiety about takings. We need facts. What is the reality of takings versus the mythology of takings? And I would charge uh, the county administrator and the county attorney to provide us with the real information about that before we start using the specter of takings to inform a political decision. Um, and once again, I thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you, Robert. And thanks for calling me learned. I think that's the first time ever. <laughs> Great, now he's gonna My go ahead. would be happy. <laughs> Kid from Boston. Okay. <laughs> we have one more speaker and it is Al Childress from the city of Key West. Go ahead, Al. Oh boy, this is a tough one. <laughs> Unmute. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. How are you doing, Al? Uh, good morning. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and putting this all together. And, and Roman, thank you for putting the uh, meeting together on Friday with all the uh, uh, city managers throughout the county. I think, uh, as you said, I think it's important that the, in, in any issue that you're dealing with the state that we speak as as with one voice. So um, I'm looking forward to working with your office. I, uh, we had a staff meeting this morning with our directors and many of them are, are online listening. And I know uh, the mayor's online listening and uh, a number of the other elected officials on the, on the Key West Commission are listening. So uh, uh, with that said, uh, you know, I appreciate it again and uh, look forward to us talking and, and working this out and, and, and moving forward on it. So thank you, Roman, again. Thanks, Al. And happy holidays to you. Uh, Shanna, is that it? Is that anybody else? Ann Olson. Um, actually, we have uh, Ann Olson has another question. Okay. Go ahead, Ann. Good morning, and thank you for letting me speak one more time or ask another question. Um, I, because there are so many county and city officials on the line, I just wanted to um sort of reiterate a point that we we continue to make in writing but uh, I, I i'm saying this uh, you know and on one hand on behalf of last stand but i am speaking as an individual as bob was or robert a moment ago um but so many of these scenarios that we looked at um are based on the 2012 modeling with no updates so while to make the, the numbers work we're now excluding the permanent residents known as mobile home owners um, we aren't including things like the Navy or the colleges or uh, any of the things that people said, these are people that will be here, we need to include them. And it doesn't include any consideration of what's become very commonplace, which is rapid intensification to our hurricanes. So our entire hurricane modeling system is based on this two tiered 48 to 24 hour evacuation scenario. Um, but that doesn't take into uh, consideration the whole uh, um, effect of rapid intensification. And I'm watching on the one hand, the county looking at billions of dollars of expenses for resiliency and road raising down the road and things along that line, while at the same time looking at adding potentially thousands of additional ROGOs and B-PASS to this. It doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't square that circle whatsoever. Um, uh, three of the four overarching themes that were addressed both by the Florida Commerce and what was noted at the beginning of this meeting is public safety, um, quality of life, and environmental protections. And I don't see with large numbers of um, ROGOs being added that any of those are really considered. So um, I, 
again, just wanted to kind of make that point and lost one of them in the process, but <laughs> I'll wrap that up there. Okay, thank you, Ann. I don't know if staff has any response to Ann's, but thank you, I think they're good comments. All right, um, where are we, Shannon? Are we done? Um, Lauren Law. We have uh, Haran Law, uh, Mr. David Haran, with one more question. Uh, he put his hand back. Oh, nope. I'm sorry. He 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 put his hand down. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so then that is it. We have no more questions. No more hands raised. Mayor, you want to parting remarks? Sure. Just uh, real briefly, thank you, everybody. That was um, a very open, I think, transparent exchange and, and one of, like I mentioned earlier, that we're going to be one of many um, that we're going to be, be having. I think there are still some questions and I think we had some good ones today. I think this is obviously going to be an extremely thoughtful process. I feel like we're at a kind of a pivotal moment uh, in our community here. It's not the first time. I know it will not be the last time. And uh, I, uh, I know through Roman's leadership, Shannon helping guide him through this whole uh, process, we're, we're gonna come out and I, I think a, you know, a, a solution, we're gonna come out with a solution, hopefully um, that will work for everybody. I know that might be pie in the sky, it seems right now, but uh, we do have a quick timeline that's a little concerning to me. Um, and, and maybe there's something we can do about that with the state but um, again, just appreciates everybody time, everyone's time. I hope that everybody has a really safe uh, Thanksgiving holiday, travel safe. And um, you know, we're, we're pretty open government. So you got our emails, most of you have our cell phones and, uh, and feel free to call. Um, with that, Roman, you wanna shut us down? Sure, well, thank you again, Mayor. And thank you uh, to staff for doing this and for everybody that uh, participated in this and yes, uh, we have a lot to be thankful for this holiday season. So let's be be safe and be smart out there. And I uh, think we'll be talking soon. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.